So this little tutorial came about as a result of a question I received about how to set the equalizer taps uh, on an IBIS AMI model. I wanted some graphic way of illustrating how equalizers mitigate uh, channel impairments like the non-ideal impulse responses that can cause inter-symbol interference or ISI and also what the limitations of such techniques are. I came up with this little spreadsheet illustration you can play with as a kind of a tutorial but before I dive into the spreadsheet itself I wanted to explain the background to the question. So the situation was this, if you ever used the ADS channel simulator you'll know that it supports not only IC vendor specific models in the IBIS AMI format but also the built-in generic IC models shown here. The built-in generic models don't represent a specific IC. They model industry best practices for signal processing in these devices, like these algorithms here. They also include a very handy optimizer that looks at the channel impulse response and comes up with a set of taps that best mitigate the ISI impairment of the particular channel you're using. You can do a one-time optimization or this checkbox you can uh, let them adapt as the simulation proceeds. So the first question is how much ISI can you correct with a given number of taps? In this case three taps on a feed forward equalizer. And the second question was what about um, IC vendor specific models in the AMI format? Like this one here. What if the vendor's model doesn't contain an optimizer? Just have a set of taps here to, to set up. Can I relate this, the, uh, the taps saved using the generic model to set up an AMI model, transfer the best practices from the generic to the uh, IC vendor specific? So that's how this spreadsheet came about. It's more or less a tutorial about how the optimizer works in the generic case and how you transfer the output of the generic models into a vendor specific. AMI model that uh, doesn't contain an optimizer. So here's a little tutorial to try and answer those questions. So imagine I probe my channel with a single uh, pulse at time step number three here. This is uni unit interval time steps or samples. Uh, the channel has say uh, PCB traces and vias and there are impedance discontinuities giving reflections and that gives rise to a non-ideal uh, impulse response. A given bit spills over a little bit into the adjacent bit periods here. This is the intersymbol interference. So equalization is the process of mitigating this intersymbol interference. Uh, there are two broad techniques of um, equalization. One's called maximum likelihood sequence estimation. I won't go into that here. And the other is e equalization by filtering. That's what I'm going to talk about. So imagine this 3 by 5 matrix is kind of a movie of five snapshots of the impulse moving, moving past an FIR filter window, which is three taps wide. So the, the, the pulse comes in from the, uh, the left-hand side here. It moves from left to right. So this is the second time sequence. And the third time sequence, it's centered in the window of the filter this uh, 181 sequence, then it starts to move out of the filter window off to the, uh, the right of this box. So uh, FIR filter, what you're doing is multiplying add, it's convolution. You take some filter taps here in this um, column vector, uh, three by one column vector, and multiply and add by the uh, pulse moving past the filter window. And this is like matrix multiplication. You do rows on columns, that's multiply and add convolution. And for each row on column, we get one result, uh, one element in this five by one column vector here, which is the uh, output of the filter in time sequence one, two, three, four, five. Now, if the filter taps are zero, one, zero, you get exactly what you put in. And uh, this is the original pulse. This is the kind of the corrupted pulse of these side lobes here. And with the uh, filter taps of 0, 1, 0, we, we have no improvement at all. But you can kind of guess and check what you need to do to recover the pulse. You want to kind of subtract off these side pulses. So you might want to just try and guess the filter taps are at minus 0.1, something like that. 
and the mean squared error is isn't too good at this point because the um, the um, amplitude's too low now. We want an amplitude of one, so we've got a big mean squared error there. So maybe we want to kind of um, boost this up a little bit. We'll divide by 0.8 here, and the error is a bit better there. And you can see you can improve the guess and check, but guessing and checking is not a very satisfactory uh, way of doing this. There must be some more systematic way of doing it, and, and indeed there is. What it's called is called minimum mean squared error method of, of calculating the uh, taps directly using matrix math. So I've got the same uh, setup before. I've got a de desired and a corrupted signal. And what I'm going to do is take this matrix, and what I'm really trying to do is to solve simultaneous equations. I'm doing multiply and add onto my uh, vector of coefficients, and I want the answer to be equal to 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, which is my original uh, sharp pulse. So really what I've got here in this uh, three, uh, 5 by 3 matrix is really five simultaneous equations with three unknowns, which is the filter taps. So that's too many. The, the set is over-conditioned. And uh, if you remember, this is very, very similar. If you've ever done curve fitting, linear regression, or fitting to a parabola with three coefficients, if you have five points on an xy graph and you're trying to fit a parabola with three coefficients on a parabola, you'll know you have to use a uh, regression technique. And uh, it turns out it's a, there's a matrix math way of doing it. And what you do is you take the equation, which is z equals uh, xc, which is our matrix multiplication, and multiply both sides by the transpose of x. So it's very easy to calculate the transpose. It's actually a function in Excel to do a transpose. It just switches the uh, elements around on the principal diagonal here. And then you have a new equation. This on the uh, left-hand side is actually called, it has a name, it's called the cross-correlation of, of x and z. You can calculate that pretty easily. You just do, again, mul uh, matrix multiply of the transpose by the desired z vector. And you get this number here, which is basically just a, a slice out of the center of the matrix, obviously, because the other two, uh, other four coefficients are zero. Then on the right-hand side, this uh, x transpose x multiplication also has a name. It's called the autocorrelation function of x. And again, it's trivial to calculate using matrix math. You just multiply x by its transpose, and you end up with the 3 by 3 matrix, which is this one, the autocorrelation matrix. Now we have a square matrix, so that makes it very easy because we've got an equation now of the uh, cross-correlation equal to the autocorrelation times c. I want to solve for C. So all I have to do is calculate the inverse of the autocorrelation function. And again, uh, Excel has a little uh, matrix math function to do that. That's, this is the inverse. And then I multiply both sides by the inverse of the auto autocorrelation function. And I can solve for C. It's just the uh, inverse of the autocorrelation function multiplied by the cross-correlation function. And that actually solves the uh, least squared fit to my problem. This is the best possible set of coefficients. Just as when I fit a parabola to five points, this is the best possible fit. Under some uh, mean squared error uh, caveat to create the um, uh, filter tap. And indeed, the recovered x is pretty good. The uh, mean squared error is pretty small. It's uh, 0 0.0001 mean squared error. And you can see the recovered x is pretty good. There's a little bit of uh, error on these time samples 1 and 5, but otherwise it's, it's pretty good. So what are the limits of this? Well, just as uh, when you fit five points on an xy graph to a parabola, if the points lie pretty close to a parabola, then you have a good chance of coming up with some meaningful set of coefficient for your parabola. If the points are way off the parabola, they're just randomly scattered, then the fit, you can still come up with some numbers, but it's going to not look like uh, they're not going to lie very close to parabola. So the same thing happens with uh, intersymbol interference. If the channel impairment's really severe, you'll still get a set of coefficients, for sure. But what's happening is the recovered signal is getting worse and worse. You can't do a sufficiently good fit 
if the impulse response is way off. Now you can see here, the matrix math is still giving me a set of coefficients here, sorry, here. And there's still a recovered Z, but it's looking pretty lousy now. And this is just like the situation where you throw uh, five random points and try to uh, fit a parabola to them. You'll get some coefficients, but they won't be very meaningful. So this works if um, if the channel's pretty close to uh, a decent channel. And if the channel's way off, you, uh, you the, um, the filter can't uh, mitigate the impairment anymore. So that's what's happening. That's kind of the limits of what's happening. And you can see that these coefficients are kind of um, portable. You can take them from a generic model, providing it's an FIR filter, and plug them straight into a manufacturer's IC model, um, providing it has the same uh, number of taps and the same uh, structure of filter. And that's what I'm going to show now in, in ADS, how you take these coefficients from the optimizer uh, in the generic models and plug them into a manufacturer's model, uh, an AM, AMI model. Now the spreadsheet method uh, is very good as an illustration, but I don't recommend it as a practical method because you have to kind of uh, calculate this channel impulse response. It can get very complicated. It's much easier to use the, um, the optimizer in uh, the channel simulator and write the taps out to a file. Then you don't have to mess around with uh, figuring out what the impulse response is and uh, setting up that spreadsheet to the matrix math. Is the spreadsheet's good to illustrate the idea, but in practice this is a much more efficient way of doing it. So you write the generic um, taps out to a text file. Then you simply paste the values. There's, uh, in this case, I had one precursor tap and two postcursor taps. The uh, the first postcursor tap is actually the, the cursor itself. It's kind of postcursor zero. That's the main tap here. So we have got three taps, and this AMI model also has three taps. That's why I set it up to have the same number on the generic model. And I just pasted the values in to, um, in this case, the nomenclature used here is tap zero, one, two. It doesn't matter. This is actually the precursor tap the main tap which is post cursor 0 and then post cursor 1. So you set that up and uh, plug that into the model and you can uh, run that and see the eye diagram opens up. So here's the result. This is the um, density plot um, with the PCI Express mask and the um, BR contours. This is 10 to the minus 6, 10 to the minus 12. Uh, in case you can't see them with the uh, the density plot, I've plotted them again, same data but with just without the density plot, so you can see the I, the VR contours more clearly. And you get all the statistics, you know, the height and the width of the VR contour and so on. So it does a pretty good job of opening up the eye and um, you're, you're within the PCI Express mask. So that's it. The um, the spreadsheet's available for download. You can play around with it and you know, play around with these numbers and see what the limits are of what a three-tap equalizer can do to a, um, a given channel impairment. Thank you for your attention.